Happy Thursday, fourth graders. Today we have a double day where Mrs. Carmack from the library is going to read to us again. So we're so lucky. She is reading pages 111 to 120 in Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling, illustrated by Mary Grandem Free. And to go along with that, we want to thank Scholastic News for allowing us to read today. Starting on the last sentence at the bottom of page 110, the voice echoed through the train. We will be reaching Hogwarts in five minutes' time. Please leave your luggage on the train. It will be taken to the school separately. Harry's stomach lurched with nerves, and Ron, he saw, Pale under his freckles. They crammed their pockets with the last of the sweets and joined the crowd thronging through the corridor. The train slowed right down and finally stopped. People pushed their way toward the door and out on to a tiny dark platform. Harry shivered in the cold night air and a lamp came bobbing over the heads of the students and Harry heard a familiar voice. First years, first years over here. All right there, Harry? Hagrid's big, hairy face beamed over the sea of heads. Come on, follow me. Any more first years? Find your step now. First years, follow me. Slipping and stumbling, they followed Hagrid down what seemed to be a steep, narrow path. It was so dark on either side of them but Harry thought there must be thick trees there. Nobody spoke much. Neville, the boy who kept losing his toad, sniffed once or twice. You'll get your first sight of Hogwarts in a sec, Hagrid called over his shoulder. Just round this bend here. There was a loud, ooh. The narrow path had opened suddenly under the edge of a great black lake. Perched atop a high mountain on the other side, its windows sparkling in the starry sky, was a vast castle with many turrets and towers. No more than four to a boat, Hagrid called, pointing to a fleet of little boats sitting in the water by the shore. Harry and Ron were followed into their boat by Neville and Hermione. Everyone in? shouted Hagrid, who had a boat to himself. Taken. Forward! And the fleet of little boats moved off all at once, gliding across the lake, which seemed as smooth as glass. Everyone was silent, staring up at the great castle overhead. It towered over them as they sailed nearer and nearer to the cliff on which it stood. Heads down! yelled Hagrid as the first boats reached the cliff. They all bent their heads and the little boats carried them through a curtain of ivy that hid a wide opening in the cliff face. They were carried along a dark tunnel which seemed to be taking them right underneath the castle until they reached a kind of underground harbor where they clambered out onto the rocks and pebbles. Boy, you there, is this your toad? said Hagrid was checking the boats as people climbed out of them. Trevor, cried Neville blissfully, holding out his hands. Then they clambered up a passageway in the rock after Hagrid's lamp, coming out at last under smooth damp grass right in the shadow of the castle. They walked up a flight of stone steps and crowded around the huge oak front door. Everyone here? You there? You got your toad? Hagrid raised a gigantic fist, knocked three times on the castle door. Chapter 7 The Sorting Hat. The door swung open at once. A tall, black haired witch in emerald green robes stood there. She had a very stern face, and Harry's first thought was that this was not someone to cross. The first year's Professor McGonagall, said Hagrid. Thank you, Hagrid. I will take them from here. She pulled the door wide. The entrance hall was so big you could 
could have fit a whole Dursley's house in it. The stone walls were lit with flaming torches like the ones at Gringotts. The ceiling was too high to make out, and a magnificent marble staircase facing them led to the upper floors. They followed Professor McGonagall across the flagstone floor. Harry could hear the drone of hundreds of voices from a doorway to the right. The rest of the school must already be here, but Professor McGonagall showed the first years into a small, empty chamber off the hall. They crowded in, standing rather closer together than they usually would have done, peering about nervously. Welcome to Hogwarts, said Professor McGonagall. The start of term banquet will begin shortly, but before you take your seats in the Great Hall, you will be sorted into your houses. The sorting is a very important ceremony because while you are here, your house will be something like your family within Hogwarts. You will have classes with the rest of your house, sleep in your house dormitory, and spend free time in your house common room. The four houses are called Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, Ravenclaw, and Slytherin. Each house has its own noble history, and each has produced outstanding witches and wizards. While you are at Hogwarts, your triumphs will earn your house points, while any rule breaking will lose house points. At the end of the year, the house with the most points is awarded the House Cup, a great honor. I hope each of you will be a credit to whoever, whichever house becomes yours. The sorting ceremony will take place in a few minutes in front of the rest of the school. I suggest you all smarten yourselves up as much as you can while you are waiting. Her eyes lingered for a moment on Neville's cloak, which was fastened under his left ear, and on Ron's smudged nose. Harry nervously tried to flatten his hair. I shall return when we are ready for you, said Professor McGonagall. Please wait quietly. She left the chamber. Harry swallowed. How exactly do they sort us into houses, he asked Ron. Some sort of test, I think. Fred said it hurts a lot, but I think he was joking. Harry's heart gave a horrible jolt. A test? In front of the whole school? But he didn't know any magic yet. What on earth would he have to do? He hadn't expected something like this the moment they arrived. He looked around anxiously and saw that everyone else looked terrified too. No one was talking much except Hermione Granger, who was whispering very fast about all the spells she'd learned and wondering which one she'd need. Harry tried hard not to listen to her. He'd never, be, he'd never been more nervous, never. Not even when he'd had to take a school report home to the Dursleys, saying that he'd somehow turned his teacher's wig blue. He kept his eyes fixed on the floor. Any second now, Professor McGonagall would come back and lead him to his doom. And something happened that made him jump about a foot in the air. Several people behind him screamed. What the? He gasped. So did the people around him. About 20 ghosts had just streamed through the back wall. Curly white and slightly transparent, they glided across the room, taking, talking to no one, talking to one another, and hardly glancing at the first years. He seemed to be arguing. It looked like a fat little monk was saying, forgive and forget, I say. We ought to give him a second chance. My dear friar, haven't we given Thieves all the chances he deserves? He gives us all a bad name, and you know, he's not really even a ghost. I say, what are you all doing here? 
spouse wearing a ruff and tights had suddenly noticed the first tears. Nobody answered. New student, said the fat friar, smiling round at them. About to be sorted, I suppose? A few people nodded mutely. Hope to see you in Hufflepuff, said Friar. My old house, you know. Move along now, said a sharp voice. Sorting cer ceremonies about to start. Professor McGonagall had returned. One by one, the ghosts floated away through the opposite wall. Now, form a line, Professor McGonagall told the first years, and follow me. Feeling oddly as though his legs had turned to lead, Harry got into line behind a boy with sandy hair, who ran behind him, and they walked out of the chamber, back across the hall, and through a pair of double doors into the great hall. Harry had never even imagined such a strange and splendid place. It was lit by thousands and thousands of candles that were floating in midair over four long tables, where the rest of the students were sitting. These tables were laid with glittering golden plates and goblets. At the top of the hall was another long table where teachers were sitting. Professor McGonagall led the first years up there, up here, so that they came to a halt in a line facing the other students and the teachers behind them. The hundreds of faces staring at them looked like pale lanterns in the flicking candlelight. Dotted here and there among the students, the ghost shone misty silver. Mainly to avoid all the staring eyes, Harry looked upward and saw a velvety black ceiling dotted with stars. He heard Hermione whisper, It's too rich to look like the sky outside. I read about it in Hogwarts, a history. It was hard to believe that there was a ceiling there at all. And that the long, great hall didn't simply open onto the heavens. Harry quickly looked down again as Professor McGonagall silently placed a four-legged stool in front of the first years. On top, and frayed, on top of the stool, she put a pointed wizard's hat. His hat was patched and frayed and extremely dirty. Aunt Petunia wouldn't have let it in the house. Maybe he had to try and get a rabbit out of it, Harry thought wildly. That seemed like the sort of thing, you know, noticing that everyone in the hall was now staring at the hat. He stared at it too. For a few seconds, there was complete silence. Then the hat twitched. The rip near the brim opened wide like a mouth, and the hat began to sing. Oh, you may think I'm pretty, but don't judge on what you see. I'll eat myself if you can find a smarter hat than me. You can keep your bowlers black, your top hat sleek and tall, for I'm the Hogwarts sorting hat, and I can cap them all. There's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see, so try me on, and I will tell you where you ought to be. You might belong in Gryffindor, or dwell the brave at heart. Your daring, nerve, and chivalry set Gryffindors apart. You might belong in Hufflepuff, for they are just and loyal. Those patient Hufflepuffs are true and unafraid of toil. For yet in wise old Ravenclaw, if you be ready mind, for those of wit and learning will always find their kind. For perhaps in Slytherin, You'll make your real friends. Those cunning folk use any means to achieve their ends. So put me on, don't be afraid, and don't get in a flap. You're in safe hands, though I have none, for I'm a thinking cap. The whole hall burst into applause as the hat finished its song. It bowed to each of the four tables and then became, became quite still again. So we've just got to try on the hat, Ron whispered to Harry. 
or kill Fred. He was going on about wrestling a troll. Harry smiled weakly. Yes, trying on the hat was a lot better than having to do a spell, but he did wish that they could have tried it on without everyone watching. The hat seemed to be asking a rather, rather a lot. Harry didn't feel brave or quick-witted or any of it at the moment. If only the hat had mentioned a house for people who felt a bit queasy, that would have been the one for him. Professor McGonagall now stepped forward holding a long roll of parchment. When I call your name, you will put the hat on, put on the hat, and sit on the stool to be sorted. She said, Abbott, Hannah, a pink-faced girl with blonde pigtails stumbled out of line, put on the hat, which fell down over her eyes, and sat down. A moment's pause. Hufflepuff, shouted the hat. The table on the right cheered and clapped as Hannah went to sit down at the Hufflepuff table. Harry saw the ghost of the fat friar waving merrily at her. Jones, Susan. Hufflepuff, shouted the hat again. And Susan scuttled off to sit next to Hannah. Boot, Harry, Ravenclaw. The table second from the left clapped this time. Several Ravenclaws stood up to shake hands with Harry as he joined them. Hucklehurst, Mandy, went to Ravenclaw too. The brown, Lavender, became the first, became the first new Gryffindor. And the table, on the far left exploded with cheers. Harry could see Ron's twin brother's cat calling. Fullstrode, Millicent, then became a Slytherin. Perhaps it was Harry's imagination after all he'd heard about Slytherin, but he thought they looked like an unpleasant lot. He was starting to feel definitely sick now. He remembered being picked for teams during gym at his old school. He had always been the last to be chosen, not because he was no good, but because no one wanted Dudley to think they liked him. Pinch, Fletchy, Justin, Hufflepuff. Sometimes, Harry noted, the hat shouted out the house at once, but at others, it took a while to decide. Finnegan, Seamus, the sandy-haired boy next to Harry in line sat on the stool for almost a whole minute before the hat declared him a Gryffindor. Granger, Hermione. Hermione almost ran to the stool and jammed the hat eagerly on her head. Gryffindor, shouted the hat. Ron groaned. A horrible thought struck Harry, as horrible thoughts always do when you're very nervous. What? If he wasn't chosen at all? What if he just sat there in the hat, with the hat over his eyes for ages, until Professor McGonagall jerked it off his head and said there had obviously been a mistake and that he'd better get back on the train? When Neville Longbottom, the boy who kept losing his toad, was called, he fell over on his way to the stool. The hat took a long time decide with Neville. When it finally shouted Gryffindor, Neville ran off still wearing it and had to jog back amid the tails of laughter to give it to McDougal Morag. Malfoy swaggered forward when his name was called and he got his wish at once. The hat had barely touched his head when it screamed Slytherin!